So welcome all. I want to start with, uh, for everybody, I, I want to start with something that you said in your, in your science article, uh, for Science Journal back in um, November. Uh, very simple statement, but it needs to be unpacked. Uh, what are strategies for the next administration? Uh, you wrote, uh, it, issues, it, that was the name of the, the journal article, issues around fresh water are not particularly high on the U.S. political agenda. Uh, uh, th there's, there's no question about that, uh, but when you listen to everything we've listened to today, uh, you know, globally or domestically, uh, one has to ask the question, why? And uh, is there a, a remedy to that? Uh, it's a political question, it's a social question, uh, as well as a policy question. Yeah, let's just go down the line. It's always nice to hear somebody quote something you said and realize you still agree with it. Um, <laughs> uh, no, water is not very high on the political national political agenda, uh, with a few exceptions. Part of the problem is that water is often very a very local issue. Um, I do argue that we ought to have a national water strategy, but, but I, I would add the caveat that most of our most of our water problems and challenges are local and could be managed and should be managed locally or at the community level or at the state level or at the watershed level. Um, but there are some issues that ought to be managed at the national level. We have, a, we have a Clean Water Act. We have a Safe Drinking Water Act. These foundation, some of these, we have an Endangered Species Act. Some of these foundational national environmental laws because we don't want 50 state water quality standards for drinking water. What a nightmare that would be. Um, so there are things that we ought to be doing at the national level. Uh, occasionally you hear things come through the political filters about water. Obviously there's a big debate about the, the waters of the U.S. ruling that, that is under dispute that the EPA is pursuing and that are, that's in the courts uh, that will address some of these national issues. Donald Trump, uh, when he came to California, <laughs> came to California during the campaign, he said there is no drought. Uh, what he really meant, to the extent anyone knows what he means at any time, was that the water problems are, are man-made and political, that it's not a natural problem, which, I mean, there's some argument to be made about that. But he then also said, but I really care about clean air and clean water. So there is a, there is still a realization that people care about the environment. And maybe that's the handle that needs to be used to move policy forward. Uh, they don't want to talk about climate change? Okay, talk about weather extremes and risk. Um, talk about clean water, talk about human health. Uh, there are ways into, into this puzzle. Uh, at the federal level, I think. And Judith, before, before you speak, I, I, wa I want to point out to everybody, if you didn't read the bio, Judith was also the Obama administration's uh, Region 2 administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is, uh, along with out in, out in California, is one of the uh, EPA hotspots uh, for uh, just about everything that you can think of. So you, you have a great perspective to speak from. So I appreciated Peter saying that we really can't have 50 different states with 50 different water quality standards. But in fact, that's kind of what EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, who I want to go on record as saying the worst EPA Administrator in the history of the agency based on his confirmation hearing and based on his record as Oklahoma Attorney General where and he, he earned sued. it in such a short period of time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, so it's not even Earth Day. Um, but his record as Attorney General in Oklahoma where he sued EPA 14 times, including on the Waters of the United States rule, his confirmation statements, and most importantly, the EPA proposed budget, which is um, a cut of 31% and very significant staff cuts. What was the question again, John? <laughs> I just had to say that. Well, um, it was Peter's quote, but, but what, Peter, 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 Peter's quote that we have to go, we can't have 50 different Well, issues standards. around freshwater are not particularly high in the U.S. political agenda. I'll bring it back, I'll bring it back. Yeah, so sure. um, 
But and, and when you bring it back, though, I mean, because you, you, you just touched upon a point that I don't want to lose, uh, and, and I'll forget to come back to it. Though, in addition to cutting the EPA budget to 31 percent, what he told Chris Wallace and Fox News was the states have plenty of resources right. to right. take care of their air and water, which misses out on 80 percent of the EPA's job these days. So. Right. So I need about seven hours <coughs> to answer this. We'll but, just pare um, it down to three minutes. So the, the proposed Trump budget also cuts funding to the states. And we also know that we need a strong EPA because water pollution doesn't recognize state boundaries, and having 50 different water quality standards makes no sense. Uh, so from an environmental policy perspective, we are in a state of an environmental emergency. And issues like water quality, water quantity, and the impact of climate change on water resources, you know, we're, we're at a moment in time where we need to be more effective more efficient, more innovative, but unfortunately at the national level, things are going in the absolute wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And while I agree there's strong public support for not just clean water and clean air, but also the EPA, um, the current administration in Washington has launched an unprecedented attack on clean water. Yeah. Dan, out, out in the hallway we talked about, is this the new race to the bottom? I'm afraid that's what we're going to see. Uh, I mean, just to, to try to answer the, the question that's on the table, what, you know, why... Speak, you have to speak right into the microphone. Why isn't uh, fresh water more of a priority? You know, in my view, it's a matter of public education. It's a matter of many people around the country take clean water and take uh, being able to have access to water for granted. Um, I don't, I personally, as, as political as environmental regulation has become, and I think a lot of that is driven by, you know, fake news, um, bringing coal back, et cetera, in, in my view, um, it, it's not really very controversial if you were able to really get into the, the thinking of, of the vast majority of the public. I don't see clean water, clean air, as, as Judith was just alluding to, as a political issue at all. It's being made a political issue, but people, everybody wants clean water, right? Nobody wants their children to have to drink contaminated water. Nobody wants their children to have to live with asthma because their air is dirty. Um, and so the problem, I think, is that people don't understand uh, that what our water is contaminated. Our water supplies are at risk. I think part of the problem, frankly, is that the Clean Water Act uh, has been partially successful. So we talked about rivers burning, right, the Cuyahoga. Um, some of you may have heard stories about the Hudson River running the color that GM was painting cars that day in Tarrytown back in the 50s and 60s. Um, the Clean Water Act did a pretty good job at cleaning up those sort of in-your-face, visible uh, pollution problems. Uh, did a pretty good, the Clean Air Act has done a pretty good job at cleaning up smog ar around most of the country. Um, and so this is not in the forefront of people's minds. It's not something that they're forced to think about every day. And um, as uh, the legal director at a global NGO, this is something we deal with all the time, kind of how do we get people to care, right? How do we bring this up on people's priority list mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to, uh, we're, we try to depoliticize it. Uh, we try to appeal to what we think is true, the sort of common interests that we all have in clean water. Chris, I, I neglected to mention that uh, in, in your, one of your past lives, you were the, commis <laughs> you were the commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, which may be one of the most complex environmental jobs in the, in, in the country. Um, overseeing both uh, treatment infrastructure and, uh, and, and, and water, in water supply. Uh, you're at AECOM now, right. uh, which specializes in infrastructure and, and water tech, among other things. So uh, you know, from, from your different perspectives, I'd, I'd, love, I'd like to see, hear from both perspectives, your, 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 sure. your old government hat and your, and your new hat, too. I'm actually going to not answer either one of those questions, because I want to go through three things. You do what you um, want. So first, I think, we for me, it. and I think Peter touched on it, I think we need to understand that water is fundamentally an economic question for 
the future of the planet and the allocation of resources is an economic question. Um, and that then leads me to conclude that in some ways the, the, the curves that Peter showed us and, and the declines of water consumption here in the United States gives you hope for the, the next third um, period of water. I'm a little more pessimistic about that because of the economics of the rest of the planet. Um, and I think that is a real, real long-term fundamental challenge. But so now I will tell my only Donald Trump story that actually ties to water and goes back somewhat to perhaps how we might characterize um, uh, the optimistic future. So Donald Trump built three large office, I mean, uh, residential towers at um, 72nd Street. For those of you who are New Yorkers, you might know them. Um, and to do that, he ended up having to contribute to the park in front of it, Riverside South. He put in $16 million as part of the trade-off to build his towers. And um, the Department of Environmental Protection also put in about $10 million for Riverside South Park. Um, and this is why maybe I'm optimistic in this current administration because, so we had a wonderful opening and Mr. Trump, President Trump was there. And he turned and pointed to perhaps three of the ugliest buildings built for residents in um, New York City. The brown one is just horrendous. But said these three award-winning towers have won more gold medals from architectural magazines. They're completely leased up. They're full. Um, the architectural geniuses who built these, you know, wonderful, wonderful towers have made this park possible. And so I followed Mr. Trump, then Mr. Trump, and said that Mr. Trump was wrong because the reason why his towers were full was because of the fact that the city of New York completed in 1983 the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant following the Clean Water Act of 73 and stalled during the great fiscal crisis in the city of New York, but was finally completed in 1983. And because up until that moment, every single toilet on the west side of Manhattan from basically the George Washington Bridge down to Canal Street to the west side of Central Park went directly in the Hudson River every single day. And that you would not want to be in Riverside South Park nor live in the towers that Mr. Trump had built if we hadn't cleaned up, albeit not as completely as we would like, the Hudson River. So if we see the prism of economics, we see the self-interest for where the dollars will flow, perhaps Mr. Trump, as he's demonstrated recently, will completely change his position on this as he's changed numerous other ones. But I think the challenge for me is far greater and far more difficult and I'm not as optimistic as perhaps Peter is in terms of where the economics of water are gonna go. Yeah, um, I'm not sure why that's an optimistic story about Donald Trump. <laughs> it seems perfectly in character, uh, what you described uh, in terms of what he's willing to say about reality. Um, I wanted to actually comment on the economic piece of this. Uh, I don't know what came through from my talk, but I, I do believe the economics of water is a critical piece of this. We have to rethink the price of water. We have to think about subsidies and, and markets, and that's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, but there's also a human right to water, and balancing those is, is a challenge. But another piece of this is that uh, as much, I don't know if they're classical econo economists here, but, but Economics is one tool of many that we have to use. And one of the reasons those two curves on my last graph split apart had to do not with economics of water, but had to do with regulation. Uh, we put in place the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And, and one of the, re the results of that was that industries that had previously dumped water untreated water into our waterways, polluting their, the, the ecosystems that we all saw, uh, had to rethink the way they were doing business. So in the 1920s, it took t 200 tons of water to make a ton of steel, about. That was the process. By the early 80s, because of the Clean Water Act, it took about 20 tons of water to make a ton of steel. That's a 90% reduction in the water requirement to make steel. And I'm gonna argue that that was because of the Clean Water Act regulation. It wasn't that water got expensive. 
It's that it turned out it was cheaper for steel companies to change their steel process to produce less, less wastewater to meet the requirements of, the, of this national regulation than it was to do anything else. That was a regulatory response. So I'm in favor of economics as a tool. I'm in favor of regulation as, as a tool as well. So uh, allow me to do a reality check uh, on the Clean Water Act. Uh, if I, <laughs> Dan knows where I'm going. Uh, the fact is that if, um, I, I believe, if, uh, if Hillary Clinton had gotten, had become president, had been elected president, the pressure right now would be to perhaps overhaul the Clean Water Act and certainly its goals and regulations. Uh, and so a, a little bit of history. <coughs> uh, on April 24th, 1994, Carol Browner, Bill Clinton's EPA administrator said, this is 22 years after the Clean Water Act uh, was enacted. Today, EPA is releasing a report that shows that 40% of our nation's rivers, lakes, and streams are polluted. Seven years later, on March 27th, Christy Todd Whitman, George Bush's EPA administrator, said in a speech, despite past progress in reducing water pollution, almost 40% of the nation's waters uh, assessed by state do not meet water quality goals. And same number. On January 12, 2010, Lisa Jackson said, America's water bodies are imperiled as never before. And then to wrap things up, I don't know why she said this to, on the heels of Lisa Jackson, Gina McCarthy said, progress in advancing clean water and safe drinking water goals in the U.S. is stalled. We're still at 40%, uh, which is pretty unnerving. Uh, th th there's no doubting that the Clean Water Act made a difference, uh, financed uh, treatment plants, uh, cracked down on industrial pollutants, uh, aided by the departure of industry from a, a lot of our uh, urbanized and industrialized areas. Uh, but it, it's not doing what it was supposed to do, and that was before uh, president Trump became president. Uh, and the goals, of course, as we discussed earlier on, are long outdated and Congress never saw fit to make new ones. Uh, so two questions, are we stuck in a rear guard action? Uh, the second is, is, is there a solution, for example, should we be turning our attention to the states right now uh, as opposed to the federal government? Mm -hmm. So as a recovering federal regulator, I assume you might want to comment. Look, the Clean Water Act is a great law. It's not perfect. It only works when it's strongly and vigorously enforced. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also needs to be coupled with investment. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I worked at EPA, I always liked talking to the old water guys and gals who talked about the construction grant program. Uh, when the federal government paid about 90% of the cost to build sewage treatment plants. That's when a lot of the um, progress was made. The Hudson River, you can, you can map out when those sewage treatment plants were built, when treatment technologies were improved. Now, if you're a local government, and I was privileged to serve Region 2, which was New York, eight Indian nations in New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. I spent a lot of time talking to mayors in communities like Newark, New Jersey, uh, Camden, New Jersey, who clearly had combined sewer overflow problems, needed to upgrade water infrastructure, and they said, Judith, you know, we agree it's a big problem, but we absolutely don't have money. And telling us to take out a low interest uh, loan is not helping us, especially if these local governments are near their debt ceiling. So what we desperately need is new funding mm. at the federal level and the state level. So a little bit of good news at the state level in the state budget that was just concluded last week in Albany, $2.5 billion was provided for water infrastructure and other things. But so, so some of the states are stepping up, but I would argue that we're not going to get to the goal of fishable, swimmable waters. Um, and I always like to remind people that that is the goal of the Clean Water Act. I remember speaking at a conference and people would giggle when I said we have the goal of fishable, swimmable waters, but we're not gonna get there if the federal government is on the sidelines. 
and not only that, affirmatively doing bad things for water quality. One of the first votes in the new Congress in January under the Con Congressional Review Act was uh, the Congress repealed the Department of Interior regulation that prohibited the dumping of coal debris into streams and rivers. So no amount of state funding or um, innovative policy making at the state or local level will effectively deal with, and I choose this word carefully, harebrained ideas mm -hmm. like putting coal ash and coal debris uh, into our, our rivers and lakes. So we can't, yeah. you know, we, we can't lose sight that we can't have the federal government affirmatively doing bad things. Right. For, for those of you who don't know, fishable swimmable refers to sec section 101A, yes. 101A, 101A1. Actually, 101A1. Uh, the, uh, a level of water quality um, sufficient to support the propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and recreation in and on the water by July 1st, 1983. 1980. Yeah. Uh, which is also worth remembering. But, but, that, that, but that's important because we, you know, uh, one, of our, one of my favorite uh, professors here, a law attorney, says to me, well, you know, those goals were only aspirational. The problem is that the law has no aspirations any longer, you know, unless you use the library card uh, philosophy, which is if it was due 30 years ago, it's due today. <laughs> you know, so, uh, uh, which is fair, but it won't stand up in court. Anyway, um, so Dan. One quick yeah, no, go, yeah. So in part, the Clean Water Act is doing what it was supposed to do. It made, we made enormous progress, mm -hmm. as, as Judith mentioned. Um, but it needs to be updated. Uh, right. And I said this in this science article in November. Right. One of the things that the new administration, what, whoever it was going to be, ought to be doing is revising and updating the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act for the things that it wasn't supposed to do or that we didn't know it was supposed, we didn't think it was supposed to do in the 70s, uh, like the kinds of contaminants, like non-point source stuff. It did pretty well, as, as Dan mentioned, on the point source kinds of industrial things, but not so much on agricultural runoff that's still unaddressed. And, and almost nothing about public health goals, which are not really in the, in the Safe Drinking Water Act either. It, that's a numerical law, you know? Um, so anyway, go ahead. Well, I, you know, and at this point, it's not just the aspirational goals that are failing to be met. I mean, right. there's, uh, there are very specific requirements in the Clean Water Act that were put in there with a lot of thought by Congress. Um, one of the biggest ones is the requirement that permits are only supposed to last for five, five years. years. And why is that? That's because Congress recognized that technology would improve over time. And by forcing the EPA or states that have delegated uh, permitting authority under the Clean Water Act to go back and review permits every five years, they would ensure that the, the best technology was actually being implemented. <laughs> Um, so in that way, the statute is often referred to as technology forcing. Uh, the problem is that permits are often issued for much longer than five years. They, uh, because of administrative extensions, it's not unusual to see the same permit in place for 15, 20, 25 years. Um, so we're stuck with technology that was agreed back in the 1980s um, typically to be the best technology at that time. So we basically stopped making improvements um, and, and that is a really a violation of the, the requirements of the act, not just the aspirational goals. Um, in terms of, you know, can we look to the states to do this? I think there are some states that are doing uh, progressive things. California, I think, is leading the way. In, and is specifically saying, we're gonna do what the feds are supposed to be doing in the absence of federal leadership. Um, but John asked a question earlier about the race to the bottom and I didn't answer it. Um, I'll answer it now that that's exactly what we're going to see is that, um, and that's what we were seeing before uh, these federal laws were, were passed back in the 1970s um, was, and we're, we're seeing it again, that basically uh, in order to try to drive economic activity, uh, states are basically competing with each other to create the, the sort of cheapest, least expensive environments for uh, industrial operations, um, whether you're talking about agriculture and uh, big CAFOs, whether you're talking about uh, power plants, manufacturing, 
Uh, every, no one wants to pay more than they have to if their goal is to make the biggest possible quarterly profit. So um, there are progressive states that are doing excellent things, but without a meaningful federal floor, uh, floor it's not going to be useful uh, in part because, as Judith pointed out, pollution does not respect uh, state boundaries. So I, I have a small challenge to this the, the five-year permit, though, though I agree with you, and, and Chris, maybe you want to address this. The, we all love the best available technology idea, but um, does the Clean Water Act really force technology? Um, because we get, you get to a point where the kind of innovations you need uh, have to be spurred. Uh, that there's nothing in the law that, uh, that is, is so stringent that anybody's going to go out of business until somebody develops the technology. So you can find yourself in the situation where it's 2017 and the best available technology was developed in 1970 and what are you supposed to do? You know, and, 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 and what do we do, what do we, how do we spur that innovation? You know, how do we, and that would be, if, if I was looking at, one, uh, as a, at a major reform of the Clean Water Act, that would be one of them, is how do, you, how do you actually force the technology in the way marketplaces make things happen? If I could just real quickly yeah. try to respond to that. I really think con Congress was, was pretty ingenious in, back in 1972 because had, had the government actually done what the act says it should do, which is to actually go back and look at these permits every five years and review them, uh, a full technological review, uh, that would be the motivator, I think, for innovative companies to continue to create new technologies that would allow for, for uh, a better uh, treatment of these, uh, these waste streams and effluents. So because that's not happening, that, that I think was a, would have been a big driver for the innovation that John's talking about, but because it's not happening, mm -hmm. because these permits get administ administratively extended, that incentive basically is lost. I was going to just jump in and, and agree with Judith that um, <clears throat> there's sort of three things that drive innovation. I think one of them is really rigorous enforcement, um, rigorous enforcement uh, of what is existing, but yet not fully enforced in the Clean Water Act would do an enormous amount to stimulate um, governments to respond, and I think that's, that's got to be a start. But unless there is a financial solution for the cities to respond or the states to respond, um, it's going to be just a, a penalty with no gain, which I think is what you were referring to as your challenge with. So I do think we have to rethink the model, particularly on a municipal and a state level, of how we fund clean water and how we fund um, wastewater because I think that model is increasingly broken and you've reached a level of uh, unsustainability and Mayor de Blasio is struggling with that here in New York where one social gain which is affordable housing and maintaining a affordable housing stock is at odds with rising water and sewer rates um, in terms of home ownership. So I think we are gonna have to see technology enforcement and then creativity on new financial models for cities and states and water um, entities to figure out a way to <clears throat> pull out of the economy on an economic basis uh, enough wealth to create the next level of technology for water quality and wastewater. So Chris is cr absolutely correct, and I want to bring this a little bit back to the morning conversation. Yeah. And here's why this is such a pickle. People are flocking to cities. It's wonderful to, to live in a city. You can take the subway. You can use a community garden. You can talk to neighbors. And so you don't die of heat death. Your neighbor will save you. That's the lesson I got from this morning. So I'm going to make friends with my neighbors again. Um, but the, you know, the cost of water infrastructure is enormous. And you know, we still have major problems with combined sewer overflows. Um, at EPA Region 2, due to the amazing work of the career staff, uh, we finally got New Jersey to agree to individual permits, not general permits. And, you know, there's a hope that we may meet water quality standards, but there's still a big combined sewer overflow problem in New York City, in most major cities, not so much on the West Coast. So every time it rains hard, I worry about water quality. I don't just enjoy the raindrops. Um, add to that our legacy, our toxic legacy. So it's been really interesting, uh, EPA's role in promoting Superfund cleanups in cities. 
So if I could just, again, do a commercial for the incredible career staff at EPA Region 2 who should not be laid off. Um, they were able uh, to add three new federal Superfund sites uh, in New York City during the Obama administration, whereas before the entire life of federal Superfund, there was only one Superfund site in all of New York City. And that's kind of suspicious, right? Mm -hmm. One Superfund site in all of New York City. So EPA added Gowanus Canal, Newtown Creek, and the Wolf Alpert uh, Thorium site in yeah. Queens. Mm -hmm. The interest in restoring the Gowanus Canal is unbelievable, and Newtown Creek. And it's, it's not just the wonderful people at River Keepers, it's neighborhood people, it's you know this guy, Jared Kushner, you may have heard of him. He has a development along the Gowanus Canal. So maybe Gowanus Canal will proceed. <laughs> um, but you know, you think of a Superfund site, sometimes you think of an, a, an abandoned factory behind a fence in an empty field. This is a Superfund site in the middle of Brooklyn, where right. millions of people live. Newtown Creek on the Brooklyn uh, Queens border. Um, this resurgence in urban sustainability also includes urban waters. Right. And so it's sewage, it's our toxic legacy, it's our land use patterns. And I'm a big believer in when the people lead, the leaders will follow, and the people of Brooklyn and Queens are getting it. Right. You know, I, there's one little interesting factoid that I, I wanted to share that you shared with our students. Um, talking about some of the, the hidden things in cities. You talked about the pesticide survey and where the most concent the co biggest concentrations of pesticides were found in the, in the state. Yeah, so years ago when I worked um, at NYPIRG, New York Public Interest Research Group, we did a study on the heaviest use of pesticides in New York, and everyone assumed it was upstate New York in agriculture. It's actually New York City. Heavy pesticide use in buildings, um, restaurants, parks, Right. Um, and there was heavier pesticides in Bronx than there was in the, in in the Black Bear County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and so a real clarion call to embrace integrated pest management. Yeah. The pesticides, of course, have enormous yeah. uh, water quality impacts, not to mention health impacts. Sure. Chris. Can, I, can I pose a question to the panel? Because this to me is a, is, is a fascinating one. It goes back to Gowanus and, and Newtown Creek and swimmability. So, the local water bodies in the city of Newark are cleaner than they've ever been since I forget going back to 1790 or whatever the, the worst period was, much like the, uh, the Rhine River and the uh, Peter's remark. Um, but the, the amount of money that we will have to spend to deal with the CSO problem and the non-point source problems to get to the level of swimmability is enormous. Um, the long-term CSO program that has been imposed by DEC pursuant to the Clean Water Act is requiring the Department of Environmental Protection for an, on a fairly small way of enforcement about $2.3 billion over the next 10, 10 years. To me, the question is, how robust can the environmental community have a debate about the prioritization of limited resources for long-term goals because you're, we're never going to be in a position to buy all the things that we want. And unless we're buying this, the things that we need and want the most, much like your risk analysis, Peter, I think we're going to be, we're going to be in, a, in a very, very tough situation. So if it costs you know, 15 to $25 billion to get us to swimmability, is that truly money well spent, given the number of environmental issues associated with water as well? Yeah, I'd like to say something to that, because I, 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 I want to bring up my objection to the phrase fishable and swimmable. Uh, the history of the drafting of the Clean Water Act is that that section of the law was written to create an ecological goal, not a recreational goal. And the ecological goal is level of water quality that supports the propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and recreation in and on the water. And the big goal in the waters around New York City is a level of water quality that brings back oyster, uh, that brings back the, the balanced ecosystem that is supposed to exist in that they, harbor seals are supposed to be there, oysters are supposed to be there. Uh, and uh, so we're not just talking about the people need another place to swim. We're talking about restoration of a piece of ecosystem that means something to Long Island Sound, the Raritan, the Hudson, as well as New York Harbor. So I, I know we love using the phrase fishable, swimmable, uh, 
it, it makes my skin crawl uh, because <laughs> really the, the, the big goal in that, uh, the big section of that goal was uh, ecological, was the propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife. And, uh, and that, that is worth the money from, from my point of view. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think Chris is asking a really tough question. Um, I do, and I don't have an answer to it directly. Uh, it's always been a debate, how much are we willing to spend for what we want, and how do we decide what we want? Um, that's partly why I think there ought to be a national debate about these things. There ought to be a National Water Commission to revisit some of these things. But I do want to add, I do want to frame it a little, I want to expand the frame that Chris presented. What he basically said is, how do we spend the limited money we have how do we prioritize the limited money we have on the things that we want from environmental protection? And that's a critical question. But the other piece of the question is, do we really understand what the cost of not doing something is? So we have a certain amount of dollars. Where are we going to spend it on environmental protection? But we also do not have a full understanding of the real costs to us of not doing certain things. And who bears those costs? Uh, we don't value ecological services much in dollar values. We don't know how to do that. We don't have a complete understanding of some of the epidemiology of some of the contaminants that are in our waters because we're not doing the epidemiological studies. And I do think if we had a better understanding there, we would realize that it, it was cheaper to do some of these things that we now think are expensive than not to do them. It's sort of like the climate change debate. We, we hear, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money to change our energy system. Now, that's debatable. But nobody is accurately saying, all right, if we don't do anything, the costs of uncontrolled climate change grow astronomically over time. But we're not measuring, we're not doing that comparison properly. Um, I agree that, it, that the questions um, raised are difficult. How much are we, will, we willing to spend? I mean, a couple of points I would make. One is that there has been an enormous amount of flexibility built into the, the it really is an enforcement process um, through which these, these uh, uh, consent, uh, consent orders have been entered that I believe go back to the late 80s, or early 90s at the latest. And there have been a series of consent orders that have been entered into between the state and the city uh, concerning how to deal with these CSOs. Um, I agree it's tremendously expensive, but I know both EPA and DEC, I think, understand the challenges, the economic challenges of, of dealing with it. I don't think deciding we're just going to live with polluted water is the answer. So I think the policymakers have to, have to decide how quickly these uh, solutions can be implemented. But I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition. Um, the other point I would make is that I think clean water, and I, I agree with John, I mean, I'm not sure we necessarily want people or expect that people will be swimming in Newtown Creek anytime soon. Um, but the ability of people who live in Brooklyn and Queens to be able to, uh, to kayak, for example, on the water that has, I think, enormous quality of life implications. I think it also, the more people connect with their waterways, the more they understand the value of those waterways, and the more willing they are, they are to continue to invest in those waterways. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just make those, those yeah. points. Yeah, and Chris, the, the question you, I, I agree, agree with everybody so far, but what Peter said, you're asking the right question, and, and the problem isn't whether the, the answer to your question is yes or no. The problem is that nobody's asking the question, you know, that we're actually not having that debate. So we're skipping over that section of the Clean Water Act because it's easier for us to skip over it. If we're going to say it's a goal that's not worthwhile, let's have the conversation, decide it's not worthwhile, and not pretend like it's, it's, it's not in the law. If it is worthwhile, then you have to figure out something right. to do. The, we, the, we have the, to ask the great, the great thing about me posing that question, and now it looks like I was saying, ah, we shouldn't waste all our money on all this environmental <laughs> protection, which wasn't why I was really asking the question, because I want to come back to my, what I started off with, is that um, out of my pessimism of where we are drives an enormous amount of public policy for aggressive enforcement of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, because I don't think we fully understood the consequences of urban pollution and national pollution in any way, shape, or form. 
And when you think of the implications of climate change, which are beyond what we're debating here right now on a fairly local level, you've reached, you've reached an existential point in human history that unless there is a paradigm shift in how we actually are end up mm. talking about these issues and understanding, and I would just say the economic consequences of not responding is catastrophic on a level that I don't think anybody, even those people who really, really study this, and just so by way of coming back to your ACOM introduction, John, the, we are doing work for the city of New York and lower Manhattan and coastal resiliency and how do you redesign lower Manhattan in the face of sea level rise. And just roughly, and we're only into the very beginning of this study, and it's the four communities right in lower Manhattan running from the uh, two bridges all the way around lower Manhattan and up into the World Financial Center. Um, simply put, to protect that community, we're talking about two to three billion dollars worth of uh, potential long-term infrastructure. Senator Schumer, to his enormous credit, got us $179 million to start. Um, so unless there is really fundamentally a paradigm shift on how we understand the consequences of pollution and we are not going to be able to extract the wealth out of the economy as it exists today because it's unsustainable, because you're competing against health care, you're competing against affordable housing, you're competing against all sorts of other very, very important human needs. And the reason why I just posed the question wasn't to, to advocate in some way we shouldn't be doing it to bring a certain level of clarity that there's got to be a huge paradigm shift in how we understand the consequences of not doing something. So we are where we are now with a new administration. Uh, so what is, a way, what is a way forward for all these great ideas? Where do we take them? Is the administration hopeless? Uh, do I we forgot to add, <laughs> Trump, do we, do we take it elsewhere? I forgot to add, and Peter was right when he said, well, that sounds like a typical Donald Trump story. Trump did turn to me and he goes, I never knew that. That's really interesting. You know, you're right. That really does make a difference for me leasing up my building. So there was some small sliver of sort of anecdotal hope there that the consequences of pollution, well, I guess that didn't last long. Yeah, you, you, so you, so you, but don't, the, you don't have Judith on Okay, this but the real message is there is no Christopher Ward whispering in his ear right now <laughs> what <laughs> really is going on. <laughs> okay, so I, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to comment on that. But it's a, sad, it's a sad commentary when the only hope we have for environmental protection is if there's an economic advantage to somebody in the Trump family to do something. The, the fact that, no, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That'll get me in trouble somewhere. So where do we go from here? Um, I think there's tremendous public support for environmental protection, including on climate change issues. And there was a recent Reuters poll uh, where people were asked, should the EPA be strengthened, remain the same, or be weakened or eliminated? And there was bipartisan support for strengthening the EPA, 41%, mostly among independent voters. So 41% EPA should be strengthened or expanded, 26% remain the same, 19% weakened. Mm. So I think the challenge is getting members of Congress to push back on the Trump policies. It's, it's not going to be easy. Getting people in the business community to really stand up, particularly on climate change issues. Um, I want to read a brief quote to you from Washington recently, the head of the Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Mulvaney. Uh, announced a few weeks ago, quote, we're not spending money on that anymore, that meaning climate change research. We consider that to be a waste of your money. So that could be an entire book, or at least a chapter in a book. But if you look at the economics, and here in New York, look at Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we can't say that climate change caused Sandy, but the warm water in late October made Sandy more intense than it would have been. So this is one storm primarily hitting two states, really hard, New York and New Jersey, about 180 fatalities, and Congress then had to provide $60 billion for Sandy recovery, and then lots of private sector money. That was one storm. Mm -hmm. There's going to be other Sandys. So I think this all comes down to 
do you pay now or do you pay later? And then who pays? And I think um, the real hope is making sure that citizens and students are well informed, that they become politically active. I don't mean that in a partisan way, but if your Congress member is brave enough to a hold a town hall meeting, show up, put your Congress member's phone number into your, um, into your phone and call them once or twice a week, as I do. They love hearing from me again and again. And um, I think that's the, the only hope here is democracy. So uh, I, I want to particularly ask for your and Dan's help with this. Um, things like this were tried before. And um, you know, the, the contract in, with America, it didn't go well for them when they tried to upend a lot of environmental laws. And there's, a, there's I think, a big misunderstanding with just how much the paper is worth that some of these executive orders are written on. You know, so for those of you who have given up hope because you see the president flashing an executive order that he says deregulates climate protections, yeah. Uh, the fact is that, and as I think as Gina McCarthy told you, you know, the, the climate executive order is nothing more than a piece of paper. WOTUS is nothing more than a piece of paper. But it would be helpful for people to understand um, you know, what, what, what this means, you know, uh, that there's an executive order only takes you so far and that there's in fact an onerous new regulatory process that has to be gone through to undo old regulations. Yeah, um, yeah I'm happy to, to speak to that. And I think it depends on the executive order. Of course, um, yeah. So to, to contrast two of them, uh, one of the earliest ones related to the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Keystone Pipeline, Keystone XL, um, those were not, uh, efforts to reverse a notice and comment rulemaking. They were basically um, more discretionary decisions that federal agencies had made <coughs> under the Obama administration um, that frankly were more easily reversible um, at the, you know, by directive of the president. Um, so it was the Army, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers that had made a decision to require an EIS for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is ultimately, the, it's part of the Department of Defense, and when the President issues an order that says, I want you to go back and take a fresh look at this and decide if it's really necessary to do an EIS, uh, an environmental impact statement, um, the, uh, the commander in charge of, uh, of the division of the Army Corps that had made that decision understood very quickly what was uh, being uh, directed and reversed that decision in a matter of a week or 10 days. Uh, when you're talking about uh, a, a, an executive order that says, go back and take a fresh look at the, uh, the uh, clean water rule, the waters of, waters of the United States rule, that's a very, very different story. And in fact, the EO went so far as to say, I want you to think, to look at whether to adopt Justice Scalia's view of what the definition of waters of the United States uh, should be from the Rapanos uh, case. Uh, that starts a process within EPA, and EPA appears to be moving uh, pretty expeditiously on that process. But EPA, in order to withdraw an existing rule, is going to have to go through a whole new rulemaking process. Uh, the most recent indication is that it intends to do that in two separate rulemakings, one to withdraw the existing rule, and then a separate process to, uh, to promulgate a new rule if they ever get around to doing that because these things typically take anywhere between two and three years when you're dealing with, uh, with such a, a major rule uh, from the time that they uh, issue a, a proposed rule to when they uh, finalize it. Um, so uh, I think it's true on some of these orders they are not worth uh, more than the paper they're... Uh, and, and, they, and they reflect importantly on, on what Judith was just saying. Uh, when you, 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 know, you see something like this on the news and, you're flash, and the president's flashing it around, find out what, the New York Times and the Washington Post do a pretty good job of taking these things apart. Look into what they really mean because they may be launching, launching a three or four year process that you actually could influence. Uh, and uh, these, these are not, some of these are not fait accomplis. I mean, they're, yes, administrative decision making, the president can influence that though. Westway is a whole other example of, of what can happen with that. But um, all the more reason, and, and, and we do have uh, an administration that wants its way very badly. 
and wants you to believe. Uh, wants you to believe with all your heart that when they show an executive order, it's all done. Uh, and invisible to you is a long process that you could be writing letters to your, your Congress people about, to the EPA about, to your senators about. Uh, that's what upended the contract with America's plan to uh, upend our, our, our environmental laws. Yeah. So if I could add one thing to Judith's comments of, in response to John's question. We're also going to be looking to the states. Some people have commented on this already. You know, what, what the federal government doesn't do, some states will do, and we'll go back to some of this fractured policy. Um, but California is going, is going to protect water quality and going to figure out how to invest in certain things and how to deal with carbon budgets. And we have a cap and trade system in place uh, that, that's working. Um, so there will be more and more state responses. And then the third piece, I guess, is we're going to see a lot of lawsuits that try to slow things down um, or change things or use, use the judicial system uh, to either enact things or prevent things from being un, unenacted. And so building on that, I think the most important elected positions in the whole country is state attorneys general. <laughs> so having New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, for instance, saying he's going to sue to protect the Clean Power Plan, waters the United States, and other state AGs have a vital role to play, along with um, environmental advocacy groups, Water Keeper Alliance, Earth Justice, Natural Resources Defense Council. You know, there's just so much bandwidth to go around. So they're going to spend, you know, Dan is going to be in court. Um, he's never going to see his friends or his family. He's going to have a miserable existence for the next four years. He's going to do really well, then he's going to be tired. And so you students in the audience, if you're serious about environmental protection, and you are because you're here, if it's what is your passion, <laughs> you've got to go to law school, and preferably Pace Law School, which is... <laughs> number three in the country for environmental law. Or our master's in environmental policy program if you don't want to practice yes. law. Yes, master's, yes, yes. So we need energetic, smart new lawyers who've grown up with sustainability and who can learn from the Dan Estrins of the world and essentially you know, do what our Constitution envisioned, which is making sure that our laws are enforced. One final point. I've been wanting to write an article about this. When a new governor is elected, when a new president is elected, we don't change the vehicle and traffic law. Stop signs, stay up on the corners, you know, stop lights, stay up. Why is it when administrations change, either at the state or federal level, suddenly it's discretionary on whether or not you enforce environmental laws? I would say the environmental laws of our country are just as important as our traffic laws. Excellent. We're going to wrap up. Uh, I, I, I want to put up, as we're talking about the states, my, is my old friend Bob Alpern still here? He raises yeah. his hand. Uh, I, I want to put a plug in for um, um, the kind of water resource planning for New York State that is a, uh, a regular thing for California, successful or not in, in all circumstances. But we haven't done water planning in New York State for a very, very long time. And um, I love the idea of a national water plan. It unnerves me, we don't have a state water plan. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I mentioned this earlier on, and I want to mention it again. Uh, we, we live in a state where we have the illusion of living in a water-rich state. And in this water-rich state, Rockland County wants to desalinate the Hudson River. In this water-rich state, New York City is almost completely dependent on conservation and repair. They're not going to be making any new reservoirs anytime soon. Uh, and uh, you can just take that and multiply it through the whole state. You know, all this rain we get, all the rivulets you see, do not feed anything. And uh, we're not building more containment. So uh, we need a water plan here. Our, our population, we, and we have a governor and a mayor who want the population to grow. And they want to build New York. Uh, you can't do one without the other. So uh, as we look at the state, New York State in particular, water planning, and uh, um, my friend Bob Alperin here has been an advocate for it for for decades, and uh, I, I hope we get to see it sometime soon. Brilliant idea. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. So, great. Panel, thank you very, very much. This was terrific. Everybody, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. That was great. Good discussion. Right.